In 2019, video games raked in over $120 billion. No other entertainment industry comes anywhere close. Not the entirety of global streaming, Netflix, YouTube, Disney Plus. It dwarfs the global film industry and the music recording industry, including iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, all of it. The gaming industry has grown faster than anyone could have ever imagined. It is now a $139 billion a year business. In terms of revenue, that's bigger than worldwide box office, music streaming and album sales, the NFL, the NBA, MLB, and the NHL combined. The most bullish analysts predict the video game industry surpassing $300 billion by 2025. Yet in this gilded age, where the revenue generated would make the video game industry alone the 60th most productive economy. Concerns from within that the current trajectory is unsustainable. Dark skies loom on the horizon. The studio behind Bioshock closing its doors and laying off most of its employees. Activision Blizzard slashing about 800 jobs. That's 8% of the video game makers workforce. Not to paint everything as bleak, the video games industry is growing and should for the foreseeable future. Record-shattering games that make their publishers billions are still to come. I'm not predicting a pending crash. This isn't 1982-83, the sequel. But the present model, with its hollowing out of developers, expected rush to sell consumers on the next great platform, promising games that redefine hyper-realism and unparalleled intense, immersive experiences. Dynamically engineered to utilize power, processing, and core algorithms, augmented visual designs promote the finest details in PlayStation games, particles of dirt on clothes, or rust flakes on metal. This generation is gonna be a bigger leap than any generation we've done before. This generation is special. because we've really unlocked this new capability to connect with the characters and worlds in a way that no previous generation has allowed. Well, isn't that special? That all comes with massively inflating development costs for the games themselves. It's an arms race. To reach higher sales, developers have to pour dev hours, money into their headliners. What worked in their last action game won't garner interest on its own. So it's ever this quest of one-upmanship to outdo the competition, including from a publisher's own studios. Outdo yourself. This undoubtedly weighs on creativity, discourages a talent pool from entering game design and programming to work on such massively scoped projects of which they'll play the smallest part in creating. Or worse, chews them up, spits them out. It ultimately funnels game design and releases to ever fewer, tired, retread, familiar formulas. That can't be sustained in the long term. The bulk of game development is racing toward a point, somewhere on the horizon, where the risk-reward analysis in producing a given game of the caliber these power-laden systems justify is only feasible for the most financially backed of publishers, the market leaders whose clout and dollars can throw a thousand-man studio into a two- or three-year mega-project. And even then, most of those publishers can ill afford to promote all that much creative or artistic expression niche concept games. Smaller titles that are more likely than not to be a commercial flop. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand by. Much like record labels as pop music matured, not unlike Hollywood's summer movie trajectory, the video game industry is laser focused on its next blockbuster, hitting home runs on the next game everybody has to have. It's a race toward cramming in more daring special effects, more marketing, nonstop player engagement, even more fully cinematic experiences as the ultimate escapism. Like the recording industry, they're adding layer upon layer of more production hours and applied hit features, formulaic renditions of each component that they have the highest test market responses to, additional studio work as the initial feedback comes back to the studio, 
what to amplify, what to strip. Now this business model, it's great for players and Tim Sweeney's weird ass rock collection, but it is a nightmare <laughs> for workers. To keep players happy, Fortnite has to roll out new features all the time, which means for developers, crunch never ends. Manufacturing hits by focus group and directive. Always increasing costs. Often shutting out and suffocating creativity. At some point, squeezing out their own price point as a mass-produced disposable consumer good. The cost of a premier title video game has remained fairly consistent since the NES's heyday. Inflation obviously has gone up somewhat since 1989, yet the cost of game development has increased 50-fold. The pure economics of selling a game don't make as much sense. Publishers are turning to downloadable content, to paying for additional levels, additional save slots, for loot boxes, all to help recoup some of the development costs of their would-be hit. $60 is essentially too little to pay for the amount of money that goes into the vast majority of blockbuster console games. That's why there's stuff like season passes or downloadable content or loot boxes or any of these other ways that game companies have figured out how to try to make more from what they have. Is a great system, but I want to make and the industry? Making all this money doesn't have a relief plan in sight. What are Sony and Microsoft marketing to us concerning their next systems? Vastly improved audio, and in particular 3D audio, isn't something that came out of the developer meetings. It's much more the case that we had a dream of what might be possible in 2016 when we were years having these conversations. And then worked out and developers were already banging up against the limits of the hardware. And a lot of the flash controller in the SSD was designed for the industry and the data streets operation, but also with priority. So to see there, for example, there are a lot of players who are heading into some new location. Custom priority is there, and a number of custom gigabytes, namely a custom flash controller, and a number of custom units. In any case, you don't need to know any of this. You don't even need to know that your data is compressed. Pretty cool, right? They're chasing the future. I say chasing the future a brand of gaming ours. inherently too expensive for all but the most successful developers to stand out within. We've been pitched solid state drives to process millions of data functions simultaneously. State of the art graphical ray tracing to allow for 100,000 objects in game to act independently of each other and respond different directions regarding light sources and lighting techniques, shadows and effects. 4K or 8K resolution, since we all must have IMAX sized televisions. Full immersion virtual reality. Massive servers that will be able to accommodate cloud computing of the most resource intensive games in thousands of a millisecond. But somebody has to make those games. Also, that developers and publishers can pour resources, ever more strained resources, into the next era of games that will blow away anything you saw over the last few years. So you enjoyed effortlessly swinging from buildings rendered in beautiful 1080p at 460 frames per second in Spider-Man on your PS4 Pro? Love the textural effects rendered as individual blades of grass swayed in 140 discrete wind patterns during gameplay while taken in the landscape of Red Dead Redemption 2? How quaint. You want your Xbox Series X to give you hyper-realism, the likes of which will give you extended moments of emotional catharsis. For us, it's always about more seamless worlds with the next generation. We can bring the world to life in a way we've never experienced Halo before. We're delivering four generations of content better than you've ever seen them before. This console is especially awesome for Game Pass members. With the faster load times, you're going to be able to experience all the games within just a snap of your fingers. We are giving gamers the option to connect across devices and across platforms in a way that we never were able to before. This isn't just a console launch. This is about the future of gaming. Your PS5? It's going to transform the gaming experience and leave you unable to comprehend how you've ever picked up a controller beforehand. It generates butterflies in my stomach and that goes to tickles in my spine and that creates goose pimples and then that penetrates my mind and then the, the whole big bang explosion. In the past, I've called this time to try. It simply has been impossible at 
Blu-ray disc speeds were now possible. Whoa. Developers were already banging up against the limits of the hardware. PlayStation. That leap comes at immense cost. Sony and Microsoft are chasing unreleased AMD processors to do cutting-edge work high-end PCs aren't going to be incorporating before they launch. Even Nintendo. For generations now, comfortable to rest a half-notch or two down in the arms race, knows that to stay in the foreseeable pool of ported major third-party releases, they'll need to pick up a walloping amount of processing power and HD graphics at minimum into their future iteration or follow-up to its little machine that could. It's one thing for hardware manufacturers to sell us on cutting-edge systems, but the pressures mount for studios and publishers to stand out on that system. In 1980, every game was a single developer project. A single programmer. The team approach to game development and compartmentalization only really took off after Mattel Electronics touted the approach. But the typical bestseller of the era was a one-man show. And there's only so much cost baked into a one-man project. The hours put into creating his or her masterpiece. Fixed costs. By the mid-90s, game development had grown to more typically 15 to 20 person teams, with a little help for specialization where larger studios were concerned, spending several million to produce a game. By 2005, the typical AAA title was made by a 30 to 50 person studio over the course of the better part of a year at a production cost of perhaps 20 to 30 million. Today, 20 million is an under the radar smaller published project. A Nindies Direct. You blinked, you missed it. A triple A title? Maybe a $400 million endeavor by a large 400 to 1,000 person studio, taking two to three years to bring to fruition. The proof is in the numbers. Just look at big studio output over the years. In the late 90s, EA, Ubisoft, Activision were producing 90 games a year. By 2010, that output dropped to 28 games between the three giants. In 2019, it was just 19. With their intense buy-up of numerous studios, just 19 games. That each take much longer to perfect the details and get from concept to digital storefront. And most of those 19 games? Sequels. Remakes. Because publishers know an original IP can break a company if it flops. If we do not deliver hit products and services, or if consumers prefer our competitors' products or services over ours, our operating results can suffer. Competition in our industry is intense, and we expect new competitors to continue to emerge throughout the world. Our competitors range from large established companies like Activision to emerging startups. In our industry, though, Many new products and services are regularly introduced. Only a relatively small number of hit titles account for a significant portion of total revenue for the industry. We have significantly reduced the number of games that we develop, publish, and distribute. In fiscal year 2010, we published 54 primary titles. And in fiscal year 2011, we published 36. In fiscal year 2012, we expect to release approximately 22 primary titles. Publishing fewer titles means that we can concentrate more of our development spending on each title and driving hit titles often requires large marketing budgets and media spending. Fewer eggs in fewer baskets. Less diversity. Less risk. But the payout? The payout is huge if one of your two or three hits are absolutely killer. But if they're not, if you can't pony up 500 million to put out the next Battlefield or Far Cry, an Assassin's Creed, a Red Dead, or a Call of Duty, if you don't have the annual updated Premier Sports franchise cash cow, it can be a bit of a minefield. The first thing is, a very dear friend of mine, Cliff Blazinski, when a guy like that who's as talented as he is and has a lot of money and creates a new studio, when he's his studio goes under because he has a couple of mediocre hits, you know there's something wrong with the game industry at that point. Especially for those mid-sized publishers. Even the big guys stumble on hundreds of million dollar budget flops. From one of the Fallout 76, anyone? All of my people Mass Effect? Risk. Star Wars Battlefront 2? In 2005, we had Take Two, Bethesda Softworks, Electronic Arts, THQ, Eidos, Warner Brothers. There was an entire tier of major publishers at the top, and a healthy middle tier putting out 
mostly trusted quality content of pretty renowned production value. Several were bought out, consolidated, exited gaming altogether. Activision bought out Sierra Online, then combined with Vivendi and Blizzard. THQ collapsed. Atari went bankrupt and is a shell of a shell of a shell of its former self. LucasArts disappeared. Death by Mouse bought out by Disney. Bandai bought out Namco. Konami just about called it a day and went pachinko or bust before timidly sticking his toes back into the water. Midway couldn't survive and disintegrated. Eidos was bought out by Square Enix. Koei merged with Tecmo while Atlas collapsed, and Sega eventually bought the name to resurrect as its own subsidiary. And beneath these more famous giants among the top 25, the ranks of mid-tier games publishing is even more harrowing and filled with defunct publishers disappeared despite strong catalogs and seemingly worthwhile sales. Filled with meteoric rises and crashes, the Telltales, the Majestos. And I know some of you will retort, but that's the free market at work, no, no, no. calling the slowest, least innovative. Newer, better studios have risen to take their place, which has some facet of truth to it, but the degree is nearly unprecedented. We're at a point now that to make a successful video game that'll reach a mass audience, except in the odd Cinderella Runaway hit that nobody saw coming while 2,000 other indie studios beat their head against the wall hoping to land any relevance or sales, to reach success, you have to be a big studio. And said big studio has to be able to throw eight or nine digit budgets at major game development to produce a game with a good return on investment. Because success largely isn't there for most games. An electronic entertainment design and research institute study looking at game profitability found that just 4% of all games that entered into a state of production had actually earned a profit. And of the games that make it to store shelves or digital, that make it to that final retail product, just one in five managed to earn a profit. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, in February, uh, around 850 games launched on Steam, which is about 40 a day, and about 82% of those didn't even make minimum wage. Now, later in the talk, I'm going to explain where these numbers are coming from. Uh, but uh, by this, I mean that a singular person uh, the, the money that came out of 82% of the games that came out on Steam would not support a singular person. And, and of, of, the, of, of every other game, 7% uh, of those games that launched on Steam actually made enough money that uh, the studio would survive. Again, this surviving thing uh, is kind of my opinion of how much money you would need to survive. Uh, but uh, yeah, roughly about 7% could actually go on and make another game. This is me taking every single game that came out uh, on Steam in February, working out uh, pretty close uh, estimates for how much um, they made. I'll say that I've been optimistic, I, I, which might sound horrible, but um, I would say there's a lot of games that sold zero copies, but I can't prove if they sold zero copies or not because um, it, it's a difficult thing to check. But uh, on average, the average game on Steam now is selling about 50 copies in its first month. And it means that uh, you haven't been able to rely on Steam to sell your game for a while now. But now especially, please don't. If you, I see a lot of new developers coming in and thinking, if I put my game on Steam, people will just buy it. It's not going to happen. Being on Steam means nothing now. That's a high rate of product failure, pushing creativity and unique game design to the periphery to pour more resources into fewer games and take less risk on unknown IPs or unproven formulas. We all see this. The endless first-person shooters with missions on rails, the action titles. We've always seen some degree of follow the leader, but the point is high value stakes and sheer cost of game development exacerbate the problem and leave precious few Cinderella stories left to bank our hopes on. The only way out publishers seem to focus on is to force success through massive budgets, to throw more money into flagship projects, more programmers, game designers, specialist resources into these massively expensive projects. <laughs> Every game needs more diversion and detail, more freely explored space, more virtual freedom in a richer, deeper, immersive game world. 
that, that's all cost. Incredible cost as resolution and detail are enhanced. All to outsell an iteration of the same game to the same core audience that ages along like with your content. Like me on the original Nintendo. The original fucking Nintendo. It's the best thing ever. That consumer who we all presume has to have more and better next year. Lest they move on to some other franchise, some other system. All to satisfy us gamers. No single manufacturer is pushing hard against that trend to show any other way. Look. No. <laughs> Nintendo. Like, how do, how do you miss Nintendo? Nintendo is what he just described. Nintendo is that company that brings family and friends together under the banner of fun. It's the Disney. They make quirky, unique games and aren't tied at the hip to the newest processing chips and proprietary GPUs still under development. Well, Glass. kind of. Nintendo is a company of many directions. They've always been advocates of weather technology, of dialing back the latest technology, holding off just a little while to give a more affordable system, to give developers a window to develop quality software with known hardware instead of struggling with the newest tech money could buy. When they worked against these principles, their sales and products suffered. Because they still had really recognizable franchises with personality on their systems, they've sold. They sold tens of millions on the Game Boy with its 1970s era processor and monochrome screen through the end of the 1990s. They went to bat with the dialed back Game Boy Advance, running 16-bit processing power and low resolution, while their competitor ran with a top-of-the-line handheld playing approximate versions of PS2 games just released on the console. The Wii was famously a retool of prior-gen hardware, a GameCube tailored to motion control in a high-definition graphics era. All sold amazingly well. But Nintendo's pivoted since the Wii era. The 2DS was surely an inexpensive late remodel of the, of the aging 3DS, but it was more of an inexpensive Meet final Nintendo swan song on the 3DS's lifespan than Nintendo enacting Nintendo the latest version of its embrace of its weather tech in novel new systems. The Wii U was Nintendo's answer to an HD graphics system, albeit with the kernel of switching between handheld and television. The 3DS wasn't exactly state-of-the-art, but as a handheld, it could lean into its first-party library as a child or Nintendo fan system. Nintendo 3DS, it's a game changer. With the Wii U and the Switch especially, Nintendo's made a return to cutting-edge handheld technology. And the games they lead with? Still very expensive endeavors. We expect Breath of the Wild 2 and the next Xenoblade, Metroid 4. We expect all 48 trillion Pokemon in the next Pokemon series. We want 700 fighters in the next Smash Brothers. These are expensive first-party flagship titles, whose household familiarity over the last 35 years, the success of the system is built. The big system sellers are in its vast indie library, which stirs excitement, but it's its first-party staples. The studio that pioneered the genre is bringing buoyed by an excitement surrounding premier ports like Doom and be. Witcher 3. Slay hordes of demons with devastating guns and single player and crush your friends in online multiplayer. What's this? When Doom tears onto Nintendo Switch this holiday. Holy the Shin Games Wolfenstein 2 Holy sends you on a mission to bringing two iconic first person shooters to Nintendo Switch. It's software. The studio that pioneered the genre is bringing yeah! the to your yeah! anywhere you want to be. Devastating gun. Dude! Oh! Whoa! 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 Wolfenstein! Oh! Software. The studio that pioneered the genre is bringing the critically acclaimed Doom to your TV. Oh! In a lot of ways, Nintendo's also relying on that expensive, breathtaking spectacle.
and there really has been no challenger, no serious contender to throw their hat in the ring with the premise of a different model, a different viable solution than the race towards outrendering, outspending your last Opus Magnus. That is, until Intellivision pitched a very different vision. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh! Yes. Oh, oh, Mika! A little awkward. Oh, I actually like that one. That's pretty funny. Now, I'm excited about Intellivision Amico for all sorts of reasons. You notice the name of this channel. My soft spot, my first love in gaming, are the classics. <laughs> and here's the company that yeah, appears to get me. To Younger Wave, Gen X father, very young kids, the adores gaming, two of but you right. can't pour dozens upon dozens of hours into a bevy of new games. Don't get me wrong, Breath of the Wild was an amazing trek across the 150 hours of time spent here and there over a year plus. PlayStation exclusives have fantastic narratives that I want to dive into. I want to immerse into Fallout or some heavily crafted world. But I'm actually way more excited about the potential in sharing a console experience with my wife, my daughters, my parents, my in-laws. With my less game-savvy friends. Virtually no one in my social circle is a gamer. We should try to play a football game now. And what do you do? You put in Madden, just handing a controller to a non-gamer is a non-starter. And then explaining the menus and the this and the that. People don't realize, non-gamers gamers don't realize how intimidating and scary a PlayStation controller, how, how aggressive it is, yeah. right? And so that we are going to complete. I can't play video games with my dad anymore. Yeah. Isn't that a damn shame? Honestly, casual games and mobile time wasters, they fill a niche. They're entertaining to play. But somewhere between impulse mobile play games and the dedicated weeks and weeks to play and wallow in Death Stranding, there's an audience for gaming in between these poles. Hey, listen. Now, I'm not suggesting Amico upends the gaming industry. I'm under no illusions that it doesn't have some large uphill battle to gain recognition and make a compelling case to the consumer. Hey, go buy an Amico instead of a Switch for more inclusive all-around family play. But a good share of its intended audience isn't even debating whether or not to buy a Switch. For all its charm, Nintendo doesn't draw in as big a family audience as you'd expect. To that audience, Target's aisle of Switch games looks like a healthy mix of cartoon appeal kids games that may resonate for the kids, but probably doesn't really jump out at the parents. Ay, ay, ay. We look like cartoons. Mixed with a lot of intensive gamer type games. The Dooms, The Witcher 3s, The Astral Chains, The Darksiders, the staple fare that you'd see on the opposite side of that aisle in the Xbox and Sony sections. No, that audience really isn't even shopping for a gaming console to begin with. Not because they have no interest in playing or interactive entertainment games, purchasing movies on streaming services, going out for diversions to entertain their kids. Amico's mission is to open up an option they didn't think they had. Yes, family, yes, friends, family, friends, together, friends, family, together. Amico bills itself as a casual co-op alternative for that market. A diversion option that combines casual low-entry games with group play dynamics and kids-safe content that isn't strictly child-centric shovelware. If even a modest success, Amico reveals a path forward for any other potential manufacturer. And another player or two in the industry couldn't hurt. Which could take two key takeaways into consideration. One, there's some level of audience out there that's not 20-somethings, early 30-somethings, dedicated lifelong gamers craving the next level experience. And you can create a platform that isn't a mobile app to satiate their tastes. And two, importantly, game design can in fact forego the latest state-of-the-art graphics and processing. 
So one of the problems with indie developers, let's call them mid-size indie developers, the problem is, is because they're creating so much content in 3D, you need tons of artists, you need tons of programmers, you need you need people who are doing motion capture, texture mm-hmm. mapping, splines, you know, so many different things that it takes a lot of resources in a, you know, to get a AAA game up and running these days, right? And God forbid you have a mediocre game because now you just crashed and burned and the $10 million is gone. The great thing about only doing 2D games is that you don't need $10 million to make a game. You don't even need a million dollars to make a game for our system, you know, um, there are going to be better experiences that, than sell ga- than mobile games, right? Um, but they're not going to be forty-hour one-player adventure things. It's not. It's not. Look, there's other systems that are doing that out there. We're focusing on fun gameplay mechanics that you can play with 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 your family and friends. That's what we're focused on, right? That doesn't take a whole truckload of cash to design and create games like that. We know. I can tell you. You know, the average uh, the the average um, development cost for an Intellivision game. And again, this is going to fluctuate, but I can tell. You right now it's around two hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? So you're talking like five, six, seven people on a team, two programmers, two or three artists, a designer, a producer, whatever, you know, maybe audio guy or whatever, and and those people are working in you know five, six, seven months on a, a game. Again, you can do the math in your head to what people make per month and, and this and that, and you'll see that it's you know anywhere from one hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars to make a really high quality game in two D that we're talking about. Put more risk and new ideas out on the market at a much less terrifying production cost, because video games aren't a zero sum audience. There is room to expand the audience be it family gaming, casual play, seniors, group co-op, or the retro market. All audiences, mind you, that don't put much stock into what goes into a $400 million budget game. Games these days have become so complicated from the controls, the complexity, the menu screens. I mean, everything about it just screams, you know, hardcore gamer. And Intellivision is taking this cost-effective approach to games publishing. They're building from the ground up, but they're not building the next Square Enix or Activision game. It's not just the games, it's really the whole like philosophy of how games are going to be made, how developers are going to be paid, how developers are going to be supported. You know, um, you don't have to, as an independent developer, you don't have to like hope for the best, like spend uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars on on a little indie game and hope that it sells in the app store among the thousands of games that come out every day. And when it doesn't, you're done. That's the end of your career as a, as a games developer. So yeah. uh, it's a different it's a different model. It's a different market. It's a different strategy, a different way of doing stuff. They're a games incubator for dozens and dozens of indie studios, screening from among thousands of ideas submitted by mobile and small developer studios. These are passionate developers who have the kernel of a great idea or a vision for the next unique game, but really might not have the financial wherewithal to scale it up, to get it ready for retail. Or they're not interested in the direction they need to go to make a competitive game on an app or eShop. Several of those developers probably don't have the marketing budget or graphic design budget, likely don't have the in-house music background or experience in some cases getting games into production in front of a larger audience. And this is where Intellivision's team is able to contribute resources to help get these projects from concept to retail. As a large publisher could. When and where they're interested in doing so. Financing of game development for Amigo is upfront. It's in part for some, wholly financed for others who are willing to keep that title exclusively on the Intellivision platform creating its own first-party in-house games. For developer studios, it's the promise that it's better to be a big fish in a small pond, being a popular game on an audience that might be in the hundreds of thousands or low millions within the first year or two, if all goes according to plan, 
pretend to be a minnow unseen in a sea of other indie games, and take your chances of being within that 4% of all games that go into production to become profitable by getting discovered on Steam or the mobile app store or any of the leading consoles endless eShops. Hey, maybe a big publisher picks you up. In the end, most indie developers will tell you the same thing. There's just too many games out there. Too many really good games competing for the same elbow room, along with a lot of mediocrity, and not enough real estate on a screen for a console owner or an app store browser to find your game, or even know to seek it out or that it exists. And while independent small studios have emerged pretty big in the last decade as the standard bearer for less expensive game development, with mobile apps and the rise of the smartphone and the iPad using popular affordable engines like Unity, there's just been this deluge of small startups and fly-by-night studios joining in, largely going for broke in a sea of competition. For every successful app, there's six dozen inexpensive clones ready to eat its lunch. And for every innovative or creative game that finds its way to mobile, a hundredfold more shovelware titles are there in a similar enough theme or search result to bury it in app stores or eShops. Ratings and digital storefront design does help to illuminate some of the better games and bestsellers. Large publishers pick up smaller indie titles that they think will make a fortune and pour marketing into them, but that doesn't help the vast majority of brand new games, absent reviews or downloads, but still with a great core gameplay idea. There are a thousand new apps launching on iOS or Android each week. A thousand. Some are found and rewarded, but most, a lot of really good concept games languish in obscurity for lack of a spotlight. One thing that could help them is a unique platform for them to shine. Short of that, vast amounts of money to break through the clutter and get in front of would-be players. And television's purposely devoting its own walled ecosystem in order to insulate games on its system from an overabundance of shovelware and similar games that compete for the same select players. Sure, they'll have some variations of games on a similar theme, but each game stands apart. It's got to be unique. Each game is screened, curated. It's got to meet their in-house quality testing. And the overall number of games actually published to the system is going to stay in the low dozens per year, meaning an overall smaller library for the Amico buyer to explore and select from. Five RPGs, not 300. Six different party guessing games. Not 800. My thing is, they'll bring us a game, and they'll say, look, here's a mid-level game that Sony's not going to pay us to make this. Apple isn't going to pay them to make this. Google, Facebook, you know, this is a game that we believe has a really fun game gameplay mechanic. And will, will you help us make this game? The answer is, wow, we love this. Yes, let's go forward with okay, this. Okay. We're now... You're now your partner from day one, but here's the best part about it. Here's what I've never told anyone. There will never, ever, it's going to blow your mind and a lot of people are going to hate on me. I don't care because it's the right way. There will never, ever be two games released at the same time on the Intellivision Amico. What that does is... Puts the spotlight on that game. Exactly. And I don't care if you're Ubisoft, EA, or Activision, or you're some dorm room developer, you they're both going to get the same amount of space and time. So if we turn out everything every 10 days to 14 days, there's a brand new game. That means that that small developer gets the number one spotlight front page of the store it's like in the old days when you used to get the front cover of egm or the old days when you would get the end cap units well they still have those the end cap unit at best buy or, or, or you know or, or the or the front page of the sunday circular the game of the week what's the game of the week all of the attention will be on their game. So I ask you, if you're a small, mid-sized, and even a big developer, would you rather be the head honcho lead game and us pushing it like crazy the whole time from the time we start the game? Because we want it to succeed. Because if it doesn't reach a certain quality standard, 
we'll kill it. Even though it's our money, we'll, we'll still kill it because I'm not going to put out crappy games on our system, right? Would you rather be there with a hardware manufacturer that is pushing you and promoting that is put- you? In and promoting the heck out of your game and making it the number one thing, or would you rela- would you rather release a game on Steam where a thousand other games are coming out that week, or I say Steam, or I say the Wii, uh, sorry the Switch, or I say the mobile gaming, or would you rather t- take your chances and roll your dice on there and and hope th- hope and maybe it becomes big? Because I got news for you, there are thousands not hundreds there are thousands of super duper talented developers that are creating games for mobile that you have never heard of and have never played because they're getting lost and they don't have marketing maybe they don't have marketing chops maybe they're really smart artistic programmers and artists maybe they're really smart in that category but not in the business and marketing side that's okay those are the kind of people we want to take under our wing we want to make them rock stars the risk is going to be a lot less to make games for us that's the first thing but the most important thing is a lot of these small studios and even small publishers they don't have a market department they don't have millions of dollars to spend on marketing and ads and facebook and this and that they're praying that people will talk about it that influencers will talk about it and make videos on youtube they're they're working it hard to try to get everybody with no budget to, or a very little budget to find out about their game why because there's thousands of games that come out every week on mobile there's hundreds of games that come out every week on switch now hundreds and thousands of games that are coming out on Steam every few weeks. It is become, because now it's so easy to create video games now, where you don't even really have to be a talented programmer. You can just bring up a game studio or figure out Unity and this and that. And, you know, all of the finesse is kind of going away now because anyone can create a fart app and put it up there and start making money, right? And so we're not interested in those games on our system. We don't want those games either. The bet is this blueprint can work, and for the video game industry, there's reason to pay attention. And television is a bit of an experiment for the industry. Can you build a platform without quintupling production costs? And a library of games that don't bank on wowing the consumer with innovative graphics and costly overages that are baked into game production? Hi, guess where I came from? A computer, me and my hat. Rather, they're focused on building play mechanics, on gameplay experience, on items that can be addressed within a strict budget. Extract fun gameplay from standout concepts, translating fun individual experiences in classic games into new experiences with the group dynamic. What happens is on your centerpiece new game concepts on its more interactive controller that combine visual and touch cues, tactile buttons, and a directional pad, along with motion and voice activated controls. There's a brick wall. And, there's this and place that control scheme that, that, that into an intended group setting. Car out to be twice as big. And so once Get you're back out, to you basics while focusing on the game experience and the fun experiences the to be had. Try to roll out somebody's car. Try to hit the brick wall. And if you if you get somebody out by setting a trap, you actually get a point as well. It's different from Microsoft's focus on building a cloud that we can all tap into, no matter what our device. We're not all that enthusiastic about a company that's coming to the table with a more economic chipset and technology. But maybe we should be because it's so desperately needed by a video game industry with rapidly inflating costs. Because we bemoan regurgitated AAA titles and love our indies in principle, but the sales, where they jump off the charts, are typically reserved for those top hits where a fortune was poured into their creation. But that model isn't sustainable. Sony, Microsoft, even Nintendo can only pour so much expensive cutting edge technology into their consoles. Publishers can only pour so many hours into these massive beasts of games. Or can they? Will the first 
billion dollar budget AAA title be four times better, more worth our time, than a $250 million budget AAA title? Oh yeah. Will we exacerbate this system where successful publishers are always a couple successive flops from financial ruin? Oh yeah. Where fewer publishers put all their pieces into a few certain blockbusters at the expense of creativity and variety? Oh yeah. I don't think anybody wants that, and it can't be sustained, especially as we race towards consoles that are out to compete with the highest cost, cutting edge gaming elite PCs. Our smaller market of publishers today will inevitably shrink, not grow, and our diversity in games available will inevitably shrink as those few publishers will not be all that excited to put out half a billion dollars towards a gaming concept just to see it flop. Oh no! I keep seeing people say that it won't be able to compete because we already have these big companies that are successful in the market, you know, Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo. And so because they're so successful, the market must be saturated. It must be tapped out. There's no more room, right? Well, of course, this is ridiculous because, you know, if you implement the correct business strategy, there's always more room. And I think that's exactly what Intellivision has done here. You know, they've employed basically a a differentiation business strategy, which just means that even though they're technically in the same industry as these other companies, they're really addressing a different set of needs and wants. Um, and they're doing this by providing this console that will have games that are simple, family-friendly, and fun. And the whole concept, right, is that families, anybody in your family can pick up this game and play together and you'll all be able to be competitive and have fun and build your relationship that way and spend quality time together. And it's not dependent on being in, you know, an experienced gamer or a hardcore gamer. The games won't be super complex like a lot of the, the games are now. And, um, and I know that this isn't something that is completely vacant from the industry, but I think since the onset of online multiplayer, it's been slowly disappearing. And so I think that there is a, a real hole in the market there. And if the Amico can fill it, it, I'm sure it'll be successful. Many of you, I presume, have seen the talking points questioning whether $60 for a game is too low a cost. As if anyone's paying $60 for a game and overjoyed at what a steal it is and would happily pay $120 if you really wanted them to. To me, a new player operating, creating a new paradigm, is a shot in the arm the video game industry needs. It may be making more money than ever before, but that isn't a sole indicator of a healthy industry, nor are the current trends tenable for the long term. And that isn't to say the publishers of the industry making these games are going about it the wrong way. They're making some of the greatest gaming experiences players could ask for, and they're creating these sweeping, beautiful epics, intriguing stories, and reaping the reward putting out games that players simply have to have. But that focus neglects the other side of gaming. Unique passion projects and approaches that indie developers have been fostering with increasingly diminishing returns. A console or a couple industry players out there operating in a different lane, focusing on different types of games, appealing to a different audience, fostering smaller projects, is a bright spot for the industry, for creativity and innovation. And in television's betting that there is a floor for aesthetics and gameplay. There's certainly no ceiling. Big publishers and hardware manufacturers are now selling us on dust and specks of rust. And in television's betting that there is a floor for aesthetics and gameplay. There's certainly no ceiling. Big publishers and hardware manufacturers are now selling us on dust particles, on dirt, dirt and dirt flakes on of floor. rust. Or rust flakes Who on knows what's metal. next? They'll keep pushing. But maybe if we can get past our romance with the most epic, sprawling, beautiful graphics and dial it back to what looks pretty nice. Okay, there you go. And experience. 
the industry oh, can still profit guy. healthily and create entertaining this games. Oh no, this purple guys are just dodging the shot. They dodge the shot. You gotta yeah, like shoot around him. Yeah. Ah. Oh, lost a lost a city. city but we did get a bonus city, I think. All right, we're All right. here it goes. Light him up. Attack! 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 Come on! And television's oh. making a bet that the sixty billion dollars oh, no, 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 into mobile apps. That there may be room for consumers to put one tenth of one percent into a system like Amico to play the better selection and variety of mobile, mixed with a wide selection of what we enjoyed from retro gaming and casual Wii motion-controlled games. The Wii came out, the third biggest home-selling console of all time, 102 million units sold, and that proved that people who don't normally play uh, and buy video game systems will absolutely buy a video game system if it's seen as something that's easy and fun. One-tenth of one percent of 60 billion? is still 60 million annually. That's enough incentive for a company to chase after. So it's the tiniest distraction of a vibrant market that they're going after. And if they can do it, there's no reason others with a smart plan couldn't follow. The model and television is proposing and fostering may in the end not find consumer success. But if it does, paints a very different formula moving forward. Video game market isn't necessarily an arms race to immersive game experiences that recreate realities at immense cost. It isn't necessarily matrix technology or accounting for the billion variables and options that a computer needs to work out the ever more complex 3D worlds. The answer could just be make fun games. Oh! <laughs> oh, almost happened. Come on, let's see it. <laughs> let's see it. Come on, you're lasting, you're lasting. Oh, oh there it is. Blue. <laughs> That's on you guys. Create this platform that bridges consumer trust, gives studios room to be creative and to shine, and present untapped customers with an attractive but easily understood product to adopt. But wouldn't it be amazing if Marcy, when you're out of the house, yeah. if Marcy was able to connect with your daughter playing something yeah. and having fun together. Totally. You know what I mean? Yep. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. That's what we're going to Well, I, you know, and, and Ruby does love this stuff, and I feel like there's already this pull to play, but also to learn how to make, and, you know, uh, there's, which is cool. Is that going to be an element in a television as well? Is there going to be a development the, kind of aspect to it, too? I, how old's Ruby now? She's six. Six, seven? Six. Yeah. I want Ruby in about four years from now to be able to sit down, have an idea, design a game, and have it come to fruition on our platform. Oh, wow. That we need to, un and all of the other 10-year-old girls, I want to make a rock star out of those, those people. We're doing something where, again, you look at the average developer out there, they're either making zero money, Trying to trying to make it on the mobile world yep. with ten thousand other games a week, or you need forty million dollars, three hundred people, and three years of your time, yep. and it's a and it's a crapshoot. How about something in between? Yeah. How about a platform that people with three people in a door, dorm room can actually make a really high quality, refined game in about five or six months and make a bunch of money on that? Without Remember loot earlier, boxes, without free to play microtransactions. With, exactly, right? exactly. You, buy, you and, pay one price, you get the whole thing. Dial down the tech. Focus on what matters. Create a brand and a platform that consumers think synonymously with accessibility and gaming together. And see who comes. Double down on gameplay and player experience. Industry 
darling. Setting trends all its own. Hey, that's it for this episode. I realized there were a lot of holes in this little essay, and that's fine. I really do hope you take the opportunity to engage and comment, and whether you think something like Amico, a new platform showcasing a certain caliber and scope of games, in this case for a casual and young family audience, is the kind of disruptor or a safe haven the industry needs to showcase an alternative model. Do you see more industry upstarts trying different trends if Intellivision forges a successful model? There are so many questions, and I think this is a conversation we should be having. For the Retro Advisory Board, this is Steven. Until the next video.